All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tomoya Seri, a senior research fellow here at the Oxford Internet Institute. I see uh, quite a few uh, new faces. Very welcome to the OIA if it's your first time here. And if you've been here before, welcome again. Uh, I'm hosting uh, Turi Munter today, uh, who I just learned that he was trained in Oxford, not far from this building, just next door, St. John, uh, St. John's College. and. Um, then he started as a journalist uh, and then turned into a media entrepreneur and an investor. It's very interesting. Among many projects he had in the past, most notable one is Thematics, which is the world's largest network of photojournalism, which was sold in 2013 to Bill Gates and uh, Corbis. Uh, Turi is a partner at North Space Media, and today primarily he's going to talk about his new adventure, Polly. Um, Without any further ado, please. Uh, thank you. And I'm really flattered that you're all here. It's <laughs> freezing outside. Apparently, there are strikes. Um, so I'm, 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 and I'm thrilled to talk to you. I, I want to. I've sort of flipped this on his head. Taha asked me to speak for 30, 40 minutes, and I asked Taha whether I could speak for about 10, 15, and then ask you guys questions. Um, because what I'm really trying to do now is build something which I find extremely difficult, which has got all sorts of potentially quite exciting. Um, futures, but also some really dangerous ones as well. So I'm trying to, I'm in the, I'm in the, let's try not to fuck it up phase. And so as much feedback as I can get from you guys, the better. Um, uh, you asked me to, to give a very short potted biography. Thank you so much for introducing me like that. Um, but it perhaps, perhaps <coughs> is a way of framing what it is that I'm trying to do with Pali. Um, this is really just me trying to pretend to you all that I'm a good guy. And then, um, and then we can work out whether that's really the case later. So, um, so yeah, I, I, um, I was at St. John's, um, where I studied Arabic, and then history, medieval history, both super useful for starting up digital media businesses, um, and, um, and went straight into media publishing, a lot of writing. Um, my first business was a, I started something called the Beirut Review of Books to compete with the London and New York Review of Books. Um, which didn't work, um, and then did a bunch of other different things. In 2007, eight, as I just sort of turned 30, um, it struck me that um, the media ecosystem, media ecosystem that the web was building out, this new iteration of a media ecosystem, to technologically driven, um, was breaking lots of things that I thought were beautiful and valuable and really important for democracy. And the one thing that really hit me between the eyes in 2006, 7, 8 was um, the, there was there was fewer and fewer um, resources to do international news. So the big media organizations um, had seen their business models totally destroyed, first by Craigslist, because they were no longer the intermediator between people buying and selling stuff. And then, of course, by Google, and then by Facebook, and then the, you know, as the platforms took over completely, um, the revenues of newspapers just fell off a cliff. And the first thing that went was their foreign bureaus. Um, to give you an idea, for the war in Iraq, started in 2003. A single staff member of the New York Times cost them about a million dollars a year just to keep their safety, training, flights, security around them, et cetera, et cetera. So that was all cut. And in 2007, I thought, we have a major issue with the beginning of Web 2.0, but there's still a huge dearth of information coming from all these parts of the world that the big news organizations used to cover, Reuters, the BBC, AP, they all pulled back. And so I wondered whether idealistic, naive, <coughs> hubristic fool that I was at the time, I thought, could we build a free speech platform, a place that everybody could tell stories which were no longer being covered by the mainstream media. And so that's what we tried to build. We called it Demotics, Demos of the people. Um, and um, it was really designed as a free speech platform. But what I've been doing for the last, I mean, all my career has been trying to build political projects which have got a business engine behind them because I, I'm, I'm more interested in that partly, but also I think that you can, there's a chance of hitting scale faster if there's actually a supportive business environment to drive them up. And so what I built was a something like a news broker, a newswire. Um, you would be in Bamako, Mali, 
covering a protest that was happening there would send me the work that you were producing and I would sell it to the New York Times, BBC, whatever it was, splitting the fee with you 50-50. So that's what we tried to build. Um, we didn't achieve what we wanted to build. I wanted to build, the, I wanted to be the new Associated Press. I wanted to build a kind of a Reuters from the bottom up but with this fundamental critical difference that it would be people from the places reporting on the places rather than a whole bunch of people who look just like me, um, white overeducated males. Um, and so, but we did become the largest network of photojournalists in the world. About 75,000 people on the platform, producing work from all over the place. We were in every country in the world. I was just talking about this with Taha. We launched in 2008. 2009, the Green Movement kicked off in Iran. No journalists could get in. A few journalist friends of mine who were there, all, all were sent to the, the local Evin prison into solitary confinement. Um, and so we had two dozen Iranians on the streets of Tehran sending us images um, and stories from, from there. Um, our first front page of the New York Times came from Iran, in fact. So that was, um, that was that project. I sold the company in 2012-13 to, to, to this big American corporate. Um, faffed around, wasted time, wondered who I was, tried to retire, didn't have enough money to do that, etc. And then have started, and now for the last five years, have been investing mostly in media and media technology, mostly in the developing world, mostly because that's a better business. Um, doing that for the last three, four years. And then in 2016, the year when um, those of us less uh, imaginative or, um, or involved in, um, in actually the political cycles, finally realize that um, political consensus is broken. That 2016 is Trump, it's Brexit, my wife's Italian, there was a constitutional referendum in Italy which again gave us Salvini and Di Maio, the hard right and the hard left, bolted together in a monstrous hydra-like political hell. Um, not to mention Duterte elected in the Philippines and on and on. So the year that political consensus breaks is 2016 and everybody, especially in the media, and I spend most of my time looking at the media and thinking what's broken, how, what, what doesn't work, what could be made better, what in this transition from offline to online has been enhanced, but also what in that same transition has been shattered um, and how do we fix it. I turn around, where all the, media, all the media in 2016 turns around and says, we failed to cover, um, we failed to represent, we failed to listen. And they also go, fake news, post-truth, cultural relativism, post-modernism has destroyed any basis of reality that we have, everything's a disaster. All of which are sensible reactions. And the, re and the response to this has been huge <coughs> amounts of money put into misinformation, disinformation, trying to understand how information is propagated across the internet. And I, possibly because of a slightly psychotic instinct, rather than asking those questions, my reaction is, oh my god, I've had the same arguments over and over and over again for the last god knows how long, Brexit particularly. We must have spent billions, trillions of words speaking about Brexit with Brexit on TV, Brexit in the pub, Brexit wherever it is over 2015 and 2016. And at a certain point I turned around and realized that there were probably four arguments to remain and probably four arguments to leave and that any of us who was in Britain at that, during that year could probably write them out on the back of an envelope in about five minutes. I'm waiting for one of you to turn and go, but that's not true. <laughs> so because none of you has yet turned around to tell me that's not true, um, and nobody at the time turned, turned around and told me that's not true, I started teasing that out a little bit and thinking, okay, so Brexit, something which has literally cost us, you know, years of conversation and billions of words, um, can be reduced to actually some pretty high level, pretty accurate common arguments that we hear all over all the time and again. What about euthanasia? What about abortion? What about the classic debates that people constantly have? And it finally hit me that, in fact, there is a spectacularly limited number of arguments around pretty much any issue. It's deeply countercultural as an idea. We live in the, the period of me, um, 
we've lived through, postmodernism, post-structuralism, which is the entire intellectual effort is around complicating ideas, is around getting, is around making sure that we're breaking them open and seeing the, um, the complexities inside them. But actually, at a high, at a high level and at a functional level, there's a very limited number of arguments around pretty much anything. And if, the, if therefore there is a limited number of arguments, if they are not, if they, if it is finite, you should be able to map them. And if you can map something like Brexit, and you can map abortion, and you can map the debate around Trump's mental illness, um, or um, or whether the Earth is flat, um, you can map everything, and therefore you should be able, in theory to build a total map of all arguments. And so that, because as I said earlier, my middle name is Hubris, um, that is what I'm trying to build. Um, and that's where we, uh, so that's, that's where we are now. Um, Pali itself is, the way we've conceived of it is sort of as follows. Um, there's no way that we can yet do this with natural language processing or production. There, um, so we're thinking of this as a collaborative wiki. Um, I want to bring on as many people as possible who are interested in the ideas that we're, fla that we're flagging um, to come together, work together, and build this thing up. I'm conceiving of it as a business. In fact, we've raised private capital to build it out. So this needs a business engine to be able to drive it forward. Um, and we, we, I want to do it in such a way which ideally does not make all the problems that I see worse, but makes them better. And very specifically, the, um, the political goal behind Pali is, let me, let me articulate this most likely badly. Um, one, um, now let me back up. As I said, I spend a lot of time thinking about the media ecosystem and what works and what doesn't. Um, and one of the uh, characteristics of today's media ecosystem, it seems to me, is something you might call information surplus. Um, we've got there's a huge amount of information floating around about about everything. Um, it's sort of the opposite of um, it's the opposite of where we were um, offline, but it doesn't have. It's not all roses. I, I have an analogy in, in, in my head or a metaphor, which is, which is Lebanon. Um, the entire Middle East suffers from a massive dearth of free speech. You can't say anything. Uh, you're locked up for protests against government. You're locked up for saying an enormous amount of things. And that's terrible. And that, in a sense, represents the old world where you know, to write in a comment to the comment section of the Guardian 30 years ago, you had to be a trade union leader. It couldn't just be anybody. And to write, uh, to have your comment published in the Telegraph, you needed to be a duke. Um, terrible, terrible media ecosystem. That's what the Middle East, for the most part, still looks like today. And then you have Lebanon. Lebanon, which has got six million people and about six million political parties, and every political party has at least three newspapers and four TV channels, and everybody is just spamming the crap out of each other and has done for the last 30 years or so. Um, which means that you have the opposite problem that you have in the rest of that region, which is a massive surfeit of free speech. People have been screaming, lying, talking rubbish to each other, political, politicized content, um, which means that you end up properly debasing any kind of foundations upon which you can have conversations about truth, about politics, about whatever it is. I, I feel that's where the internet is today. Um, and. There's a great book by uh, an artist, a contemporary artist called James Bridal, um, who wrote a book called The New Dark Age. And in this book, he sort of posits something roughly similar, better articulated. But his theory is that in an age of information surplus, there are two standard responses to that information surplus. And one is um, apathy, which is, I'll never figure out whether climate change is really man-made. I'll, I'll never. I, I, Boris, Jeremy, who knows? Um, somebody else will take the decisions for me. A retreat from engagement with information because there's just so much out there. You just kind of pack up, let other people take those decisions for you. And two, the other response to it is um, James Bridal describes it as conspiracy, as a, as a move towards conspiracy. I think I'd expand it and not, not, not think of it so much as conspiracy as factionalism, tribalism, which is. I can't really do all the heavy intellectual lifting around 
all these various different things I'm supposed to know about. So let me go off and find my tribe, my group of people, and I will associate myself with them. I will take my lead, I will take my opinions from them. This is my team. I've, in a sense, I've said handed my vote to a larger grouping. Um, both those tendencies in, a, in an age of information surplus, both those tendencies um, um, lead to populism. They're profoundly problematic, but they, the, the real driver is the populism. It's on the one hand that tribalism is, of course, looking for simple answers, um, and of course, its political heft comes from very heavy othering. Who are the bad guys? Who are the them? Who are the, who's the other team? And on the apathy side, as people retreat from politics, as people retreat from engaging in information themselves and figuring out what their stances are on things, um, it provides so much more space for uh, unscrupulous political chances um, to step in. So key objective of Pali really is, can I help people like myself figure out what we actually think? Can I accelerate the people towards understanding what the opinions are on a given issue and help themselves position themselves against them? Um, so that's one. The second is, can I, um, can Pali or something like Pali help people understand the other sides of opinions? I'm struck. Every time there is a school shooting in the US, of which there are far too many, I think 40,000 people have died in 2019 from, from, um, from firearms, handguns so far this year. Um, but every time there's a school shooting, um, Twitter lights up like a Christmas tree, and you have the gun control people screaming blue murder, and you have the gun rights people screaming blue murder, and we have all heard those arguments a thousand times, because unfortunately they reappear every time there's a school shooting. Um, these are two groups of people who can't, no, so much they can't hear each other. They can't even trust the sincerity of the other side. Somebody who is in the, who's a Full, full National Rifle Association member will read a gun rights person, a gun control person on Twitter, and assume that they're funded by communists, assume that they're funded by some secret cabal of people that are trying to take down the heart of the American experience. And similarly, most people in, 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 in Europe tend to be gun control, obviously. And my reaction to somebody who is advocating, advocating for gun rights Deep in my heart, I'm convinced they're being paid by the NRA. I, I can't trust their sincerity. So, um, so the second objective of Pali is to try and frame, to try and describe ideas, describe political opinions, describe, and, and all, all sorts of opinions in a way which is as calm and as measured as possible so that you can, I can, hear the other sides of the argument. How do we build, how, how do we build an understanding of what the other teams think in a way which is calm. And there the key drive there is not so much to help people understand what these various different posi p positions are, but critically to, to build um, a, a space for conversation which is, is, has had some of the sting taken out of it. I'm struck always that sitting in a, in a university town that when all the scientific institutions were formed in the 17th and 18th century, um, obviously the key driver for them was establishing what counted as observable fact. They were establishing the rules of empiricism. But the other critical rule <coughs> they established with these scientific societies was also the rules of discourse. You cannot, you could not, from, from, from the Royal Society on, you could never tell anybody in public that they were lying. That was, so, so not only are you establishing the rules of, um, of uh, of empiricism, of, of observability, the rules of science, but you're also establishing the rules of conversation around it. And I think those are shattered. And so um, anything that we can do to help improve that space, discourse, the terms of discourse will be a good thing. And the third thing that I'm trying to do is really to just try to tell, accelerate the conversation. If we keep on screaming at each other without being able to hear the other side, we're just stuck in our silos. So um, would something like Pali, an encyclopedia of opinions, allow us to say, no, hang on, I've heard that argument. I know where you're going with it. We've already done this. Actually, the conversation is moved over here. I don't have to backtrack and explain all these things to you again. You must all have had this. But any area of expertise that you've, that you've got, when you're talking to people who are not experts in that field, you've got to backtrack so far to bring them back up to speed. Because there's so many things that you, and those conversations that you've had explaining people where you've got to take so long, and you've had them so many times. So can we actually build a system to accelerate the 
sharp bit, the pointy bit of the conversation, so we're always at that piece. That's the big idea. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm going to show you what Pali is now, um, and then I have three, four big-ish questions for you, if you, if you, don't, if you don't mind. Um, one, it's, this is a stupid enough project as it is without, on top of it, trying to build it with um, a, a, a community of humans. So um, I'm gonna, I want to ask your ideas, your advice, about, um, your, and your thoughts about how we might go about building the right shaped wiki community for, for Pali. The second thing that I want to talk to you about is um, data and ethics, and privacy ethics. I want to build something big here, and I want, therefore, to build a big business engine around it. And I think the most lucrative and best business engine around Pali is most likely data. So how do I do that without perjuring myself and bringing down the level of discourse even further? And the third thing I want to talk to you about is, a bit, a bit, is, a, is about design, some of the design choices that we've got to make and the ethics of design. And the last, if we've got time, is um, how we might use natural language processing to try and feed into the work that we're doing. I'm going to show you Pali, walk you through the taxonomy that we've built. Again, at any point, jump in. And if the taxonomy, um, actually, you may already have ideas about the, the taxonomy <coughs> itself, whether that works. If I do that. See that? Okay, so Pali is not actually going to be called Palia because Pali, too many people told me it sounded like a, it, it's actually a town in India, but it also sounded like Hindi. So we're changing it to Palia like Palia meant. Um, but so the broad idea here was to, was a very basic homepage where you see a raft of different, what we're calling argument maps. Let's take this one because it's more fun. Um, have emojis indeed cha changed the world? Um, what we have here, does that work? Okay. So we're now in, inside an argument map. Um, core title, this is what I'm calling is the, is the issue. It's a question um, with a little bit of background around it. Um, I'll come to that in a second. So here, the three tiers of the taxonomy are one, issue, have emojis changed the world? Two, positions, uh-huh. No, no in a slightly different way, and yes, but um, but more than that one. Um, so, th so this is what well, again issue positions, and then below these the arguments which support the positions above them. That's what we're trying to we're trying to do here. And here, the, my key objective was in, whether emojis on, have changed the world or not is is critically important, but there are some things which are even more critically important so <laughs> as issues. So what I wanted to do was to try and see whether we could put all the broad arguments around a given topic onto a single page so that you'd be able to get a snapshot of instantly. What, are the, what is the debate around, say, gun rights and gun control? What are the debates around abortion? What are the debates? Is Jeremy Corbyn an anti-Semite? Is Boris Johnson um, uh, uh, an, uh, an abuser? Um, to have it all, all in a single place so that you have an idea of what the landscape of opinion is around any topic. So here we have that, um, and then where would we move? We, here, you would, here is one of the arguments, people subconsciously judge others based on their emoji use. I bet that's true. Does this work? Here we go. Um, and so here what you have is an argument page. We've moved, therefore, from the big map, the argument map, which is issue, position, and then argument. And here we are actually in an argument. We've got a little bit of the backstory here. So you've got the breadcrumb trail below. Some tags around what this argument map is about. Some context. The argument itself. Counter arguments to that argument. Base premises explaining at a, at the, in the most bullet pointy way possible, what the, argu what the argument's articulating, rejecting the premises here. We will have references, I'm not sure that many people have written about this, and proponents, people who have, uh, who, are, who's, who believe this argument, who've made it, who've made it strikingly on the internet. And below we have this sort of 
layer, this social layer where I can agree or disagree with what's going on here. Up here on the left hand corner, what you have is the map itself, a little mini version of the map. Let me go back and you can see it slightly larger. Can you see it slightly larger? Will it grow? No, it's exactly the same. So here is a sort of a visual representation of the argument around, um, around emojis. Some of the questions that we've asked ourselves is, do we, wall it on, or do we want it all on the same page? We do. Um, we may be wrong. Um, some of the design questions that we've had are, wh where do we put these various different things? Should, there, should we have proponents at all? This is a key question for us, is that if what we're trying to do is to frame, explain arguments as cleanly and as clearly as possible, if one of your proponents is Donald Trump, a lot of people will be extremely excited by that and immediately associate themselves with that opinion because they, they think Donald Trump is their tribal leader and others will obviously have the opposite response. So how do we, there are design features which I'll come to sort of, uh, there are design features which have major ethical implications all the way through this project. Um, anyway, that's us. Please sign up. Please try and make an argument or try and argue or try and edit or whatever it is and please give me any feedback that you have. Um, broadly, I'm going to, in a sense, stop there um, on Pali. Do you have any questions about the website itself? Or can I go and can I start asking you guys questions? Please. Hey, could you also show how to edit this? Yes. Live demo, they never work. <laughs> Watch. Okay, so, um, well, if you were to start up here, you would obviously you'd have to sign in. I am signed in over here. But look, you'd map a new question. Um, is the OII fit for purpose? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually not going to do that because you guys are, because you invited me, which means you must be fit for purpose. Um, you'd start a question there and then you apply it through. Um, if you're inside an argument and you think you want to change things, of course I'm signed in here. But here you on the on the side you have you can see the revision history. Rebe Rebecca had produced this map. Um, and you can also edit. So when you edit, it's really live. So that's not very pretty, is it? But um, you can add a new position up here if you think that there should be another position here. You can edit the titles of all these things, you can edit all of it. Um, you can add new arguments, you can reorder them, etc. etc. So that's the way that works. And this final section is the discuss piece. So discuss. I told you live demos were disastrous there, it didn't work. Um, okay, let me read. Um, Hopefully this will, no, it's still working. What that should do is, um, what this guy should do is it goes to the wiki piece. So rather than having people continually fighting their battles as to whether the punctuation should be a comma before or, or comma after, once that battle has been had once, the idea is that you, exactly like Wikipedia, you have that argument off-site. You have that arg argument on the back end rather than on the front end. And so these discussion pages, if I could only get them to work, um, would, um, is where you do that. You had a question as well. Yeah, when you scroll down that like the initial argument page and have that sort of the, the rating scale yeah. as to like how much you agree with it, is that visualized at all? Um, like what, what happens with sort of the responses to that? So what we're doing, again, this is a hugely important question and I'm not entirely sure what the answer is and I'm going to ask it back to you. Mm -hmm. Right now, so the reason this is as, as com a complicated as a question just in, in case it hasn't it's not clear to everybody, is in the same way that we're nervous about building out proponents on this site because it risks prejudicing people in their response to content, um, I'm also really nervous about people um, flagging the things that they disagree with and agree with um, in a performative way rather than in a truthful way. If your profile is public, um, you ha you're very incentivized to say you agree with certain things and not with others. If your profile is genuinely private and yours, there's a chance you're more honest. There's a self-discovery piece which is much more honest and more interesting. So um, my sense is 
we want to keep all of these things super private, but we want to aggregate them and display them in a public way, because I think that meta information around opinion is possibly even more interesting than the opinion themselves. Yeah, I mean, I can explain a little bit more why I asked that. It's kind of one potential concern is that when you're mapping out arguments, how do you demonstrate, um, I don't I don't say validity, but like certain arguments, you can map out the you know pros and cons, and, and that in doing so, you can legitimize viewpoints that are fringe viewpoints. So how do you show that, okay, there are people who hold these views, but at the same time, the overall discourse is kind of in, in one area versus the other. Let me comment on that as well. Please. Um, I'm sort of afraid of this approach, actually, that was raised in the question, because uh, generally, logic does not require us to validate who's speaking. It only requires us to validate what they are saying. So basically, to have uh, this sort of kind of numbers-based game included in terms of excluding who the fringe is, is sort of arguing that people are not able to decide what they feel is right. Now the question then is, why do we think that? And probably this is because we are not uh, okay with their education or their, I don't know, uh, their assumptions or their culture, which are much bigger questions. So I would probably address those in a very different way as opposed to just you know going for likes and support and fringe or not fringe kind of discussion? So um, I don't know which way, how, how best to deal with this, which is why this is so useful to be having this conversation with you guys. My sense so far is that um, what I want to do is to platform all common opinions about everything. Flag all the various different ethical concerns right now. Um, but to, because we want to be, this is a, an exercise in free speech, the only politics behind um, behind Pali are really those of, of, of freedom of speech. I do not want to be prescriptive, we want to be describing all the various different positions out there. But, um, should we be layering, layering in a series of filters? So should we be able to filter the content on Pali um, based on scientific validity, for example? Uh, logical, um, logical validity, for example, um, and then also on popularity and on recency and on geography. Um, I think all of those things are potentially super interesting. A uh, key question, of course, is when we're dealing with really incendiary, extremely hurtful positions, how on earth do we deal with those? It turns out that there are lots and lots of people who I'll use an example which is pertinent to me, that um, the, the, the Jews are evil, um, money grabbing, etc., whatever it is. Uh, we've seen a rise of that, unfortunately, in the UK. Um, what, do we do, what do we do with those kind of opinions? What do we do with Holocaust denial, for example? There are lots of people who think that, it's, that, that, that the Holocaust didn't happen. We should therefore certainly be platforming that opinion on Bali. How do I build a, how do I design around that? You had a question. Well, a statement first, and then I guess another statement. I'm personally predisposed to like this because this is going to a lot of things that I think are a broken society right now. We're not engaging in civilized discourse, and that's that's hurting us globally. So I, I like the idea. Um, I come from a, a law enforcement and cybersecurity background, so I tend to think of things in terms of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And the thing that I think is the most important for this platform is obviously the integrity bit. Um, how am I, as an individual coming to this platform, going to know that these are the positions, these are the four positions on this, on this issue? Um, I'm just going to take some people that are easy to beat up on, is uh, the Russians. How do I know that this hasn't been slanted one direction or another? Um, or any of the intelligence agencies? Or any of the, um, the Koch brothers? Well, the Koch brother. Um, <laughs> one down. I, I wasn't, wasn't trying to be mean. <laughs> um, people like that aren't trying to slant this argument one way or the other. The integrity part of this is absolutely paramount. How prominent is the sort of references, or how much is that going to be kind of like part of it? Are you asking about kind of visualizations? Like how, yeah, like, 
people are going to want to see the sort of sources of this information. I think that's what's going to be useful and and be able to kind of validate an agnostic platform. Really, um, I think some of the issues are around kind of transparency and you know, who's influencing this, who's influencing that. But if you can if you can lay it out as a transparent agnostic use of data, that would well, if you don't do that, you're kind of um, you might as well not build the platform, really. Yeah. Because it just contributes to that kind of team kind of sport um, debate, you know. So that becomes critically important when we are, as I say, when we are I mean, going that second that's step. That's a huge thing to manage, though. That second step, yeah. which is validating, to your, to your point, validating arguments one way or another, either yeah. because we think that they're logically valid or because they're scientifically demonstrated, that becomes absolutely fundamental. This first phase, I think, really is, and the, the tone is, the, is critical here, we're not making arguments. We're not claiming truth on these things. We are describing the arguments out there. Um, and so I think that your, your, your issue, your, what, you, what you find is absolutely critical. It's, this, it's that next phase as we work out how we build that key val validifier. Um, <coughs> Which is going to be which is going to be tough. At the moment, for having people come on and edit and map things out, what are the guidelines for that? Like, can anyone just sign up and do this? Is there any checks and balances at this point? Um, I feel like I just have concerns about like who is editing, and can anyone just come in and change things as they see fit? Gotcha. Um, sorry, just but these, these are these are my contacts. If if any of you are interested, please please. Do feel free to get in, in touch, and maybe Twitter's probably the easiest because, well, oh, anything's fine. But um, and isn't that a hilarious cartoon? <laughs> Clearly not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, okay, so the this is I have these are my questions to you guys. So um, do you mind if I take that question and spin it around and throw it back to you? Um, so we want to build a we want to build a contributor. Base. We need to find a contributor base to propel. It has to be a collaborative project because if it's not a collaborative project, it's just me and all my friends um, who I have to pay um, to uh, who, are, who are filling up all this content, and we're not, we we will absolutely not have the breadth or critically the diversity that we need to to really be representing the world. Um, but let's take the two other obvious examples that we could follow 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 down. One is Wikipedia, and the other is Quora. Wikipedia is entirely open. It's entirely collaborative. It's br broadly anonymous. Um, it has its own moderation. It has its own hierarchy of moderation inside it. But um, everybody is um, C3PO rather than Turiman. Core is the opposite. Core is authored. So um, it's and that was their whole drive. That was their whole success was getting the luminaries of Silicon Valley to answer Silicon Valley like questions and build up this sort of basis of expertise. I think it's profoundly flawed, flawed profoundly flawed, because they are the, the, most of the people contributing to Quora tend to be interested in the responses. It's people asking, what's the best CMS to use? And somebody who has a CMS to sell answering that question. Um, but so Pali could go down either of those routes, and I think they're very strong <coughs> to not go down either of those routes, because we have a very specific problem. It's really difficult to build an argument map. It's really difficult to build an argument map. Filling in Wikipedia is difficult, but really what you're doing is you're following a narrative flow. There are templates for it. You're just filling in, you're trying to fill in facts, you're trying to describe things. If it's humans, there are templates for it. If it's scientific theories, there are templates for it. If it's asteroids, bots can do it for you. Um, with Pali, there are two very big, very, very big intellectual have heavy lifting moments. One is to describe, to figure out what the positions are on any issue. And then the other is to work out what the argument clusters are for each of those positions. That's difficult, very, very difficult to do. How does one get a community to do that? You can't just jump in and start a sentence. You can't just jump in and start an article on Pali. Because all ideas, all arguments, exist in relation to each other. So you have to build the map before you fill in the content. How do we do that? How do we do that? What do you guys reckon? Sorry, can I make a comment um, in relation to uh, your statement and your question? Um, I have studied Wikipedia, and what works there is not really to authorize people or to know who is contributing, is to record and <coughs> publicize 
the identity could be a digital identity of the person responsible for any revision or any edit. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I would add to your pile of opinions that Wikipedia has worked very well, and it's one of the most reliable sources of information, <coughs> not because it's complete, but because, uh, you know, we say that Wikipedia is a book that it's writing is never going to be finished. And having that in mind, uh, when you read a Wikipedia article, you know that it's incomplete, it's not <coughs> final, but still there is a lot of information. I think that uh, you, you need to also communicate that to your visitors somehow, that you know this is just few of many arguments that could be out there, or few opinions of, out of many. Uh, the other thing that is my question is, what makes Wikipedia very exciting, and gamify it a little bit, is the connection between different articles. Uh, and how you can navigate from one article to another. I was wondering if you have thought about uh, creating these connections between different opinions, you know. When you talk about um, emojis, uh, there might be a link to another opinion, which is about internet, which is about social media. Uh, and Well, don't ask me how to implement that, but I was wondering if that's something on your agenda. It totally is, and it's my second slide questions for you. Any other ideas about how we go off and build this community? Please. I think I generally have, I mean, as they mentioned, the whole trust of the system is very important from the start. And I think I have a bias against maybe relying on a completely open platform. Uh, one, because once you lose the trust of people, it will be hard to build it back up. And two, I think if you just open it up, there's a very good chance you might not get the representation it needs to actually get the arguments and points across. Um, and I think that's one problem I find with Wikipedia is that it's not very representative of people um, and itself works depending on what you're looking for. How would you, so how would, how would you respond to that? This is the biggest issue with Wikipedia is it's, again, a bit like the journalists who I was trying to put out of a job by building demotics. Um, they all look like me and all the contributors on Wikipedia look like me. How does one, how do we go about doing that? Limit, limit the number of people brought in Invite them in. I think invitation might be part, but I also just think it's good to be very hard. Um, it would take a while and it would be very hard. I just think that's, the, that's just the reality of it. Of building a community? Of a representative community. It will be very hard and it will take time. If you actually want to get it right. Okay. Can I go back a question? Yeah. Who, who are you actually aiming it at? Who, who are your readers of, of Pali, and what are you actually trying to persuade them to do? Are you trying to shape public opinion in, in, in a journalistic way, or are you actually just wanting to curate and collect it's the opinions that are out there? Sorry, I, I, should have, I should have probably hit this earlier. Um, there are two questions there. Um, I'm really trying to curate and collect. I'm not trying to shape public opinion. Um, but I think with the design of the site, we will eventually move towards nudging people to look at the p opinions that are not theirs but again that will be a design piece that will not there will be a systematic design approach it will not be a political a, a political approach so i'm not going to be moving left wingers to the right and not right wingers to the left we'll be looking at it in terms of an en engaging with different different ideas so that's the answer to your second question the answer to your first question who are we aiming for um if we are aiming for those people who are super interested in hearing parts of arguments which they don't feel themselves we don't have a market because those people don't exist. So the only way that we're going to drive this forward is really with search. So it turns out that people ask Google open-ended questions hundreds of millions of times a month. And right now, Google doesn't know where to send you. So it will send you to the odd debate site here and there. It'll send you to Quora from time to time. Um, and otherwise, it'll try and spit up one of those little rich snippets at the, top of, um, at the top of Google searches, most of which are not very good. And so um, what we want to do is <coughs> to start answering those, some of those open-ended search questions, slowly start build up that way. So that's, we want to be, therefore, the answer to search, which means we have a all audience, no audience. Please. I think there's a kind of, um, I think there's, a, there's almost a kind of implicit validation or legit legitimization of certain positions once they're on the site. Um, and I wonder if being much more um, much more open in, you can edit this, everyone can edit this, will uh, 
well, like we said, like we said, like Qatar said earlier, it's something that's constantly being constantly being built will uh, will add to people's uh, critical reading of the site. I guess is one thing. Um, so, for example, on the on the page for are vaccines dangerous to children? There are three points saying vaccines are safe and seven points saying vaccines are dangerous. And people reading that will say, oh, well, three versus seven, you know, that's, that's they're probably, they're probably dangerous, right? Um, so there's the kind of added, I don't know, visualization aspect to things, to things, to things, yeah, things, things as well. Visualization. So the, if you're talking about mapping out the areas and things, does the number of arguments equal the. Yeah. Um, Not that there has to be certain yeah. five, but five, four, five against, but. 1.4 might be very strong and 5 against might be might, then, might, yeah. might be very might be very weak and if you well, get into weighting arguments now yeah, you're getting yeah. Into quali- uh, now you're getting into quality of yeah. arguments issue yeah. yeah but it could be you know what one argument is displayed and you have to click through them for instance or um, they only appear once you uh, once you go onto the safe versus dangerous aspect I, 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 I don't know maybe you should have top 3 or 4 and maybe sure should. yeah that's where the sort of weighting, the references yeah. come, comes in. You know, you, and you, if you're citing a source that's had a huge study done, you know, that, that you, the metrics of that, the original yeah. research, becomes the kind of the powerful argument in that. Um, yeah, I think yeah. you're you're not the first person to say that. I'm not sure how we deal with it. Maybe we deal with it in terms of you could, we could color, 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 vivid vividness. I'm not entirely sure, but we do need to figure out a way of dealing with that here. But on your map as well, you need to show the the bits that you haven't mapped out yet. So sure. so you've got uh, you've got coloured in bits for the the areas that have been covered. But if you think it's it's so wide, then then you need to allow space visually um, for it to fill to like, fill out. Like stubs on Wikipedia, right? There are instances where uh, there's someone has said an article should be written for this, but I don't have the time or knowledge to write, to write about it. Um, here is a potential argument which I don't know enough about. To flag someone else to write it. That kind of thing. Have you seen this web page called Kialo? Yes. What do you think of it? Maybe, so, maybe you could kind of also tell people what it is. Yes. So, Kialo um, is around 2017, just as I was starting to sort of iterate templates for what Pali might look like, Kialo emerged. And Kialo is very, very similar. It's sort of a map of arguments, not entirely, very, very similar. I think it was similar intention to us. It's spelled K-I-A-L-O dot org dot com. I can't remember. Um, and um, and they, do, they do something fantastic. What they've been really good at doing is bringing on a community of contributors who are adding lots and lots of different arguments to all these various different, to, to, these, to these issues. Let me bring it up and I can show it to you. The reason I'm asking about them is because they split things in a binary fashion, like people who agree, people who disagree, and that does create a 50-50 illusion, you know, like people who are like, in favor of human rights and against them, like, it creates a 50-50 illusion. But it sort of encourages this sort of simple yes-no, agree-disagree thing that's sort of easier to handle than 10 opinions. Like no one can handle 10 opinions in their head, entertain them. We can entertain two. And that's something that you might have to consider at some point in, in the design of things. We have a sort of cognitive limitation to how many words we can hold in our head at the same time. So if I see 10 opinions in front of me, I cannot think of them all. Two, three, perhaps. It's literally how many things people will think of. Yeah, that's an extremely strong point. Um, m- my, my view here with, with is that the, the, this binary approach on Kialo is just is just insufficient, nor nor is it intellectually interesting enough for actually most people. And so, um, while there is an argument that um, overestimating the collective intelligence of the internet is a dangerous thing, peculiarly underestimating the the, the individual intelligence of everybody is also dangerous. And I think getting this so you think getting this right, I want to. I want to get this right. There's no reason for me to do this apart from to get it right intellectually. And then the trick is to work out how one renders it in a way which is as appealing to as many people as possible. But your point is very well made. What level of education do you think this is going to be written at? Eighth grade? Okay. I have a 13 year old daughter. Um, <laughs> who's, yeah, who's considerably more articulate than I am. Uh, um, okay, so that's the, the questions around Wiki. Um, this is the this is a huge can of worms for me. Um, 
Taha, your point. Um, Wikipedia is as rich as it is because you're constantly going down different rabbit holes and you, you, the, the, all those internal links are the most exciting part about Wikipedia. You, you wake up three quarters of an hour later reading about the land reforms of the Grimaldi family. I mean, what, whatever it is. Um, we want to do exactly the same thing. For us to do the same thing in a way which is really exciting, I think we're going to need a lot of data about the way people engage with content on Pali. This is, our, this, is my, this is the big ethical question. So at the bottom you saw of, it, of, the, of every article, there was a what do you think about X, Y, and Z? Um, we want to be harvesting that information, and I want to know what you think about free speech, Marmite, fascism, and um, Cristiano Ronaldo. Because um, if I'm able to map your little cluster of private opinions, and yours, and yours, and yours, and yours, we risk, one, being able to identify a completely different way that we uh, sort of tr opinion tribes, opinion demographics. The, we risk being, having something far, far more detailed, far more accurate than the kind of stuff you get from YouGov or Gallup or others. Um, but we'll also start being able to see the crossover interests that, that there are. It's not, unfortunately, quite as, I mean, I, right now, I think it's, gonna, it's, it's hard to, to, for us to build exactly the same structure as Wikipedia um, with that in, internal linking. But for example, any debate about feminism is obviously going to spin out a debate around capitalism. <laughs> Those two things are clearly linked, um, or could be potentially clearly linked. Um, interest in, uh, I'm trying to think what else. That, that's, a, that's a good example. Let's stick with that example. So that's a, sort of this macro level. How do we associate these various different big topic groupings with each other in ways which are really interesting? Um, and then, and then, if that's macro, at a sort of micro, nano level, what I also want to be figuring out by understanding all your various different individual opinions across a map of different opinions is what are the hidden premises? What are the core beliefs that are animating the positions that you have? Because, of course, I think that um, I'm a Remainer because I've you know, totted up the pros and cons of, of European safety versus being alone in a multipolar world, etc., etc. I think that my, my Romaniness is, um, is rational. My, my Romaniness may be to do with upbringing, nurture, the fact that my mother's French. Um, it may also be to do with the, you know, how much back to my mother, of course, um, you know, whether I was breastfed for a very long time. It turns out that there are certain uh, suggestions that um, breastfeeding and optimism uh, are linked. I mean, you could go really very, very deep and very eclectic here. So I want to figure that out about me and everybody else. So here, um, we want to, I want to be harvesting a lot of data from people engaging with an opinion platform. As soon as I say that, most people go, ah, great, because of course Cambridge Analytica is now defunct, so you can step into the, <laughs> into the cap. How do we think about, how do we build a smart, how do we build a business which is around data, which, is, which obviates um, the possibility of me turning into Alex, what's his name? Nick? Nick? Nix. Nix, that's it, yeah, yeah, Alexander Nix. Please. <laughs> Maybe don't call it harvesting. <laughs> like, um, like organs. <laughs> um, but also, I think it seems more like a polling model. So I think maybe if it's repurposed as an actual poll, that you actually ask people, rather than um, automatically assume that you can use your data. That's kind of like what you go with this. Yeah. You, you went to their website, they have the questions of the day. What do you think of Cristiano yeah. Ronaldo? Because I think if it's more in a polling fashion, it might actually be more direct and easy to reach out. Great point. Very, yeah, great that, point. That, that information would be available to people. Exactly. So it's clear to them that, oh, this is actually a poll, not just like me doing something in the background and so it's watching. It, and it's interesting data for everyone. Or are you thinking of how you sell that data on and afterwards? I guess the commercial decisions about what you release and what you don't release or whether or not you make it completely transparent and encourage engagement with it. Um, yeah. One thing that I've seen YouTube doing is that sometimes when I open a video on a computer without an ad blocker, they'll say, have you seen these brands before? It'll give me five brands, and I'll always click, no, I haven't seen anything, no, and it's often true. The thing is, 
that's a way for them to make money. You know, I'm sure there's a brand paying to, to ask you to, to, for you to task that. If you have a series of polls that you could throw at people, maybe, and maybe there's some ethical implication that I can't think of, but maybe a brand could pay you to prioritize a question that they want to know. So in a market survey, you know, I sell toothpaste. I want to see if people actually use toothpaste. We've got a hope, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Please. Yes, uh, I have actually one short question and a longer one, but the second one depends on your answer to the first one. Uh-oh. <laughs> so the first one is very quick. Do you have time after this for a coffee? Because I'm working on something very similar and we solved most of your problems, but we haven't solved some of the stuff that you have solved. That's yes, I do one. have co co time for coffee after this. That's great. The second question then is... <laughs> <laughs> where, where? There are two different second questions. The second question then is... It's is like Dungeons and Dragons. Choose exactly. your own adventure. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Uh, so the second question then is, uh, how, do you, how do you think about uh, well, this very uh, peculiar little problem which is called uh, uh, influencing through denial or influencing through questions? When you know you have a public policy debate, it totally <coughs> starts with the negation of what is going to happen. So if you have someone pay you uh, for a question, or for uh, even even in the negative form, uh, it might already influence public opinion. So I would probably assume that if you have a platform where you can influence things through the questions, it's it's just basically one short step away from influencing people through answers because loaded questions are you know basically the one on one of politics today. So. You, you don't ask not loaded questions. So. This is, um, you, you were supposed to take um, ethical pressure off me um, <laughs> at this at this meeting, not add more. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, we you can tell me quite how evil I risk becoming after after this. That yes, would be helpful, course. thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, my basic thinking in terms of the licensing of this data is we need to be wildly open and wildly explicit about the data that we are polling. Thank you for no longer harvesting. Um, um, and then um, I spent a long time talking to Gallup, which is a 100-year-old firm that's been doing these polls for a very long time. And um, as I described what I wanted to do, his face sort of got more and more gaunt and dropped and terrified. Um, but actually, I went to see him to try and work out what, how they limit, how they ensure that they maintain ethical guidelines. And their approach was wildly simple. It was, don't license to political parties. And that's it. And so far as what Cambridge Analytica did wrong was, I mean, what it did not do wrong. <laughs> but, um, but it was working with political parties to influence, influence the outcomes of elections. How do um, you define a political party? Or a political yes, actor? it was an intermediary. So um, exactly, that's, that's, um, yeah, that's slightly complicated. But as a starting point, that if we just start with that and then maybe expand the conversation around what counts as a political actor, their view was you don't work with political parties, you work with governments. So it's perfectly OK to work with the conservatives if they are in government and they're trying to work out what the best language is to talk about smoking to people who are likely to smoke, how to stop them do that. Um, they were elected democratically. They are therefore have been mandated by the people to run social services. We should be work they should be allowed to work with them. And Ditto worked with, um, with private companies. Um, what they have is an ethical advisory board which tells them which countries they think it's okay to work with. I think what we would try and do would be to set something up which is slightly more formal and documented. Um, but what are the holes there? Is that, can, can any of you flag holes that I'm missing?